Video games, much like any other medium, leave themselves open to the possibility of having a personal favorite. My all-time personal favorite movie is RoboCop. My favorite book is Zombie by Peter Tremaine. But what about video games? Because that's obviously what we're here for. Well, today I would like to discuss my all-time favorite game, why it's my favorite game, and just a little backstory about it. And that game is Dragon Quest IV. However, more specifically, Dragon Warrior IV on the NES. So as you can see here, this is the DS remake, which don't get me wrong, I absolutely love. It is a fantastic update to the classic game. Spruced up graphics, more balanced, bunch of other things. But it's not my preferred port. No, that honor goes to the NES version. A version which I unfortunately no longer have. At least not physically, if you catch my drift. So, what is this game about? Well... First off, it is the fourth entry in the Dragon Quest series, or as it was known at the time in the United States as Dragon Warrior. This was due to some sort of copyright issue, I want to say, with Dungeons and Dragons or something like that. I'm not 100% certain. But when it came to RPGs on the NES, Dragon Warrior was the predominant franchise. Sure, we had Final Fantasy, but we only got the first one here in the United States. We didn't get two or three. But Dragon Warrior, we had the complete NES series here in the United States. And while it wasn't the first RPG I played, Dragon Warrior 2 got that honor. Dragon Warrior 4 wound up being my absolute favorite. So what's this game about? Let's start there. Well, Dragon Warrior 4 is split up into five separate chapters. In each of the initial chapters tell its own self-contained story. So for example, chapter one, you play as the Knight Ragnar as you are trying to figure out who has been kidnapping the children within the, your respective kingdom. Chapter 2, you play as the Princess Elena, as well as her subordinates. And she is very much a tomboy that is looking to become a tremendous warrior. Chapter 3 puts you in the role of Torneco, or as he was translated in the States at the time, Taloon. And you are a merchant, and you are trying to become a great merchant. And then Chapter 4 puts you in the role of Mara and Nara, who are a pair of gypsy girls who are out to get revenge for their father's slaying. And then these four chapters culminate together in the fifth chapter, which makes up the biggest bulk of the game, in which place at that point you take the role of the hero and you basically got to try to save the world from the monsters and the forces of sorrow. So this game is, it's fantastic. As an RPG, it's absolutely amazing. Personally, I don't feel it was topped, but when it comes to the Dragon Quest series, most people, most long-term fans, favorites tend to fall be either this one or the fifth one. But some other entries here or there, depending on personal preference. 
And to me, when I first played through this, a lot of things stuck out with me. First off, the multiple chapter aspect, each one being its own self-contained story, I thought was really cool. It was a really novel idea. I absolutely loved that whole notion. And the fact that each one could have been its own separate game completely and it would have been perfectly fine. But, like I said, it all comes together for a much bigger story. The gameplay is really not that much different from the others. It's still turn-based, what have you. And the thing with any RPG especially is the story has to grab you. And for me, this had one of the greatest stories, not just in the Dragon Quest series, but for pretty much any RPG. As basic as it can be at times. And I think the thing that separates this game for me from others is your main antagonist, Sorrow is very much a sympathetic villain as the story progresses you learn more about him about what drives him which was very unusual at that time most rpgs your villain was to be perfectly frank kind of one-dimensional even in the dragon quest series they were fairly one-dimensional they want to conquer the world no real reason why they're just evil you know final fantasy great example of that um of course dragon warrior one two and three same rough idea but this one you got a better understanding of why your villain is the way he is and yes, he's a malevolent monster and what have you, but his motive is in a way kind of pure because it's out of love. Granted, misguided, but he's trying to protect the one he loves from humans who are basically scum which a lot of us can probably agree that there's a lot of human that are scum. And so it's that misguided prejudice that drives him to try and create a better world for her. One where she can live without fear, if that makes sense. And so... Watching the story unfold really hit a different point than any other game I had played at that point. And at this point, I had started to get into the 32-bit generation with the PlayStation and stuff like that. And you're starting to get into more complex stories. So... I originally did not own this game. Ironically enough, I first played it by renting it at Dylan's, also known as Kroger, depending on what part of the country you're in, back when they had a little video rental area. And this rental area still had NES games and stuff like that, and this was one of them. And I rented it so many times. To, until I finally beat it and absolutely amazing and then many years later a friend of mine gave me a his copy 
which had everything to it except the box. It had the map, had the instructions, everything but the original box. And I held on to that copy for a very long time. I mean, it's, hell, it's my favorite game. So I remember when Dragon Warrior 7 came out, there was an advertisement at the back of the manual for a remake of this game. And I was excited for that. I was like, a PlayStation remake of Dragon Warrior 4. And it was slated for a U.S. release. Unfortunately, that never happened, even though, from what I understand, it was mostly complete. So, flash forward many years later, and they announce that they're going to release remakes of 4, 5, and 6 on the DS. Now, at this point, I already had a DS and was loving it. It's a great system. I still feel it's a great system. And so needless to say, once 4 dropped, you know I had to buy it. And so this is my original copy that I purchased upon release. I also have 5 and 6. And so I played through this one and Besides the spruced up graphics, the na character names are back to their original Japanese variants. Not only that, but they also changed the dialects of the various characters for specific regions. Ragnar, for example, speaks with more of a Scottish accent, whereas Elena is more Russian. It was little changes like that which I felt was kind of unique and to this day anytime these characters appear in any other Dragon Quest game they have those respective dialects which is kind of cool if you ask me. So I'm playing through the DS version and this is where I get to this is where I pretty much why the DS is not my preferred version and there's going to be some heavy spoilers here if you haven't played this game or you don't care what have you so in the main game there's a point where you find Sorrow's loved one her name's Rosa and he has placed a guard to protect her well, you beat the guard, you talk to her, you start to learn more about him. Well, Rose has a gift, or a curse, if you will, that when she cries, she cries rubies. And that's why she is protected, because greedy humans would, try, would want to basically beat her up for her tears. Once again, humans are shit, aren't we? Anyway. Because you killed that guard later on in the game, some humans do capture her and they kill her. Of course, Sorrow finds out that she's been captured and he goes to rescue her and he's too late and she dies. And that was the final catalyst to drive him to basically become the final boss and pushed him over the edge. He evolved himself into this tremendous monster and you have to kill him. And that's where the NES game ended. You defeat him. It was a tragic ending more than anything else. Yes, you saved the world, but he was driven mad out of grief. So we get to the DS version, and there is an extra chapter. 
And this extra chapter retcons the ending to the game. You can now utilize Sorrow as a character. And you find out that one of his subordinates manipulated the whole shebang. And I didn't like that ending. I did not like that. To me, it took away from the tragedy of the whole affair. And as much as I love the DS version, I still think it's a tremendous game, stuff like that. That final chapter, I don't want to say it ruins it, but it's... It's kind of like when you watch the special editions of Star Wars and all the classic special effects were redone with CGI and stuff like that. Yes, it's the same great movie, but the unnecessary added effects kind of detracts from the experience a little. If, you know if you've seen the originals and so forth. That's the best way I can compare it. It, it, it was an unnecessary addition. So what happened to my NES copy? Well, unfortunately, a number of years ago, hit a bit of a financial spot. And so I knew that that was one of the games that I could get a decent amount of scratch for. And so I sold it. Got a pretty good amount for it. I'm not for sure how much. I mean, it wasn't a complete copy, but it was Mostly complete. Not in the best shape, especially the paperwork aspect, but serviceable. It was one of a few games that I sold during that time. Another one being Ninja Gaiden Trilogy for the SNES, which that one was a box copy. And while I don't regret the decision, because it was the right decision at that time, I do kind of wish I had it back. Now that said, I'm not the biggest physical game collector now. Unfortunately, as far as I'm concerned, the inflation rates of retro gaming has made it to where it's not a very fun hobby to try and get into. It's just getting too damn expensive. And I think a lot of us can agree that while there are some games that we would love to have, retro games especially, the price on some of these makes it, I won't say unobtainable, but you really have to want it bad enough and be willing to drop the coin for it. That said, if there is one game that I would want to get a complete inbox copy for of, it is this one. Like I said, it's it's my all-time favorite game, and Yes, I have the NES version through other means, obviously emulation, and I have a a bootleg copy that has the all four Dragon Warrior games on the NES on on a physical card. 
but while that is serviceable, it's one of those rare instances where it's not really the same as having your own personal copy. So like I said earlier, my favorite movie is RoboCop. I have over here a movie poster of it that my wife graciously got me. I got a figure over on my collection wall. I even got some stuff hanging on my wall here. I have multiple copies of this movie because I got the trilogy on DVD and then I got a Steelbook Blu-ray. I mean, I might even have a 4K edition. I, I, I have to look. Point is, I have my all-time favorite movie. But I don't have this game. At least not in that collector's sense. And one day I will rectify that. It's going to cost a bit. But it's going to be one of those instances where, to me, it is worth it. So that's it, guys. I just wanted to talk a little bit today about my personal all-time favorite game. Like I said, it's Dragon Warrior 4 on the NES. And if you haven't played it, check it out. You can also check out the DS version. It's also a great game. It's more balanced. It's also available on Android and iOS, both of which are very serviceable editions. They're basically just the DS version, except formatted for mobile devices. I may also have this game on my iPad and my phone. <laughs> anyway, what is your all-time favorite game? If you have one, let me know in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and I'll talk to you next week.